Welcome to the Totally Awesome Fishing Show. This one's a bit different because there's no fish in it. That's right. So if you want to click off, now's the time to do it. This is a story, an interview about big cats in the British Isles. I've got an interview from a naturalist, Jonathan, who has been doing research into sightings, kills, etc. for about, I think it was 30 years. But better, the breaking news is just a few weeks ago, down near Falling Bridge in Hampshire, a deer was taken down and killed. Very, very unusual bite marks on this, apparently. Second night, the whole carcass was eaten. Better still, about a week or so after that, a woman had her dogs attacked. One of the red setters was opened up, obviously by claw marks, and had to go to the vets to be stitched up. Now, too much of a coincidence, surely. If you're still disbelieving me, don't worry about disbelieving me, guys. How about listening to Jonathan and the amazing research and study he's got. It's gonna stop me going night fishing for sure. Now I've been a naturalist all my life <clears throat> and I was particularly interested in deer when I was a youngster. And when I watched deer a lot, I got more than I bargained for because I didn't realize that I would be seeing some of Britain's predators that shouldn't be here or supposedly don't exist. But when I was a child, I was only 14 when I saw a puma and it was stalking a badger. And I thought, hey, what on earth's going on here? And I watched that puma several times in a local quarry and in the woods and it had cubs, it had three cubs and I saw the cubs one day and I started to tell people, but they didn't believe me. So I thought, well, I've, I'm gonna have to keep this to myself. So um, I watched them for years, several pumas doing their stuff. I wrote about it. I thought this is my secret. Nobody else knew about it. But in time, lots of people knew about the big cat phenomenon. And over the last 30 years, I've been studying the big cat phenomenon because that's what it is. It's really phenomenal because you've got approximately half of a British population of people disbelieve that we actually have big cats then we have another half that don't just believe but they've seen they've shot they've run over they've witnessed this that and the other regarding pumas lynx and leopard and uh, in the last 20 years I've seen many big cats myself at least 20 possibly more I've seen so many that it's actually hard you know, to put an exact number on it. I've seen cubs breeding four times. I've seen cubs. I've seen puma cubs. I've seen leopard cubs twice, puma cubs twice, all different individuals. And I've seen a myriad of individual sightings going out at night with lamps and torches. And I've also followed up all the hundreds of witness reports locally and nationally around the UK. Um, I belong. I used to belong to an organisation that collected um, reports, and we would get at least two thousand reports a year. Now it is said, and I believe this, that only one in a dozen cat sightings ever gets reported. So if we were getting two thousand reports a year from the UK, it just shows you how many people were actually seeing big cats over the years and the sightings escalated in the late 90s until through the 2000s we had more and more and more sightings um, I decided to write a book which hopefully will be published next year it's actually well it's it's been started to be published now and within that book I've got a load of data regarding my field research and that's what I started to do because I realised there were so many people writing books about the sightings of big cats but they never actually documented the field evidence so that's where I came in, being a naturalist, tracking animals, badgers, foxes, deer, whatever I was looking at footprints, I was looking at scats, I was looking at remains of their carcasses they had been killed and over the years I got to learn what sheep, what deer had been eaten by a cat, what one had been killed by a dog, what one had been scavenged by foxes, etc, etc. It takes a long time, but there's a lot of common sense involved in it. Even just about three or four weeks ago, I had sightings of a cat in West Hampshire, an area that has had many sightings, 
In actual fact, a gentleman telephoned me to say that he had had a roe carcass that had been eaten in a very odd manner on his land. Um, he had heard about big cats and was curious. I went and had a look at this carcass and indeed it, looked, it had all the hallmarks on it as if it had been eaten by a large cat. The head and neck and thorax had been consumed totally and when a big cat licks, because big cats lick, that's what they do, they treat animals like lollipops, they're like us with a lollipop licking it and licking it. So they've got a rough tongue and it would lick up the skin and you can see how it had done it, which is only something what a cat does and it had crunched through bones very cleanly. And so I said to this guy, hey, look, this is definitely um, a cat eating here. So uh, I put up a camera. Unfortunately, the batteries died in the camera, but the cat did come back and it finished off that road kid the next night. Um, I had been out and I had found some scats of the animal and we found a lovely footprint that looks just like a puma footprint in some mud around his fishing lakes. So um, I thought that was interesting. So um, I'm going to put up a few more cameras out and hopefully we might capture this animal. Um, apparently some people's domestic cats have been going walkies and I am attributing that to the animal, although I don't know for certain, but it's highly likely that this puma or whatever species of cat it is, is helping itself to people's domestic animals, unfortunately. <laughs> A lot of evidence that I gather um, regarding big cats is the footprints and lately I've been casting footprints out of plaster of Paris and concrete and I have here um, a few of some of the many casts that I have of large cats. Here we can see them all here, see how large they are. Now typically, well somebody might say oh that must be a big dog, but no no there are typical pointers regarding cat and dog feet. Firstly, all species of cats have widely spaced toes with a leading toe. So they actually go up one, two, three, and down one. Dogs never do that. Dogs toes would be totally equal on an axis along there. And the side ones would be totally equal. But when you get asymmetrical toes like this, that can, that's generally a cat. And you look at the hind pad, the heel pad, with a cat, it's always three lobed. You can see they're three back lobes. Dogs only have two. So that's another pointer. A third pointer is there are no claw marks because cats walk with their, with their um, claws sheathed to keep them sharp. So you rarely get claw marks on cat footprints unless they're in mud where the cat has had to put its claws out to stabilise itself. So this is a puma footprint. These are all taken between West Hampshire and East Dorset. Now this is, this is um, an, a, a large male puma. And this one here is a leopard. And in this cast, you haven't just got the front, but you've got the hind foot as well. And you can quite clearly see a free lobed angular back pad there with asymmetrical large toe pads there. And its front foot, which hasn't got claws out, that's, that would have been about 12 centimeters wide because it would have been like that, the overall circumference of the foot shape. So, these can be found in many places and I found many over the years along with um, their droppings, their scats, their scrapes in the ground, territorial markers, sprays on trees, remains of animals. Once you actually get into it, it's, um, it's a detective kind of thing. You can find all kind of evidence which generally you would have just overlooked and thought was something to do with another animal. But these cats cannot go anywhere, anywhere without leaving evidence. Now many people ask, if we have these big cats in this country, how on earth did they get here? Well, there's one simple answer to that. And that answer is, whatever animals we humans keep, they inevitably escape. And we've only got to look at half of our animal and plant species to realize that most of them aren't native to this country. They've actually been brought here by us. By people and it's the same with animals when you think of American mink 
Indian parakeets, muntjac deer, seeker deer, grey squirrels, the list goes on and on and on and on. In actual fact, a third of all of our mammal species are not native to this country. They have escaped or been purposely released by people who kept them in captivity. And it's the same with cats. During the 1950s and 60s, cat keeping was actually a common pastime. And you could go into Harrods in London and buy a tiger or a lion, believe it or not. And people would walk around the streets of London with these animals on leads. Some of those people released those animals later on, especially because of something what happened. The governments realised that there were many people keeping dangerous animals, especially large cats, so they brought in new legislation. It was called the Dangerous Wild Animals Act. And in 1976, a new law was passed regarding people who kept animals that were classed as dangerous animals to have licences and adequate housing, and they would be regularly checked. Of course, a lot of people didn't want to pay the hefty license fee and decided that they would rather release their animals rather than go through all of that. And that's what happened. And we've actually had lots of people admitting that they had released cats, even famous people admitting that they had released pumas and leopards into the wild. Even if they didn't release them themselves, they escape. Leopards and pumas are Houdinis. They always escape. It is hard to contain them without them trying to escape. And when those animals do escape, they can live comfortably in the British countryside. We are not too cold. We are not too hot. In actual fact, our countryside is fantastically brilliant for both species, leopards and pumas, to live and thrive and breed, which they certainly are doing now. Although my... Um, my studies have been basically in the south of England, in Dorset and Hampshire. I've actually been all over the UK and even Australia looking at issues like this. And the distribution of these cats in the UK is everywhere, right away from the north of Scotland, right down to the southern coast of Britain, because people kept animals all over the place. And people released animals in remote places, such as um, in Wales, um, in North Wales especially, and in Scotland, in the Midlands, in the South. In the past, sightings were more concentrated in the southwest of England, such as um, Bodmin Moor, Dartmoor, Exmoor. But then also you had sightings in Kent and Sussex. Um, that was a hub of breeding um, in the 1960s and 70s. But later on, um, we could see how they were spreading northwards. And you had populations in the north in Scotland that were also coming down south. And they met somewhere maybe in the 80s or 90s. And that's what caused a huge explosion of all three species of large cats in the UK. And to be honest, there is not a village anywhere in, in the whole of Britain that has not got its own big cat or the beast of so and such, they've all had them because cats roam large areas, they have large territories and in the past they had to roam even further to find members of their own species for breeding. Nowadays they don't need to do so so much because the animals are evenly distributed all over Britain but there are still hot spots in the west such as in Wales, in Gloucestershire, in Cornwall, Devon, Dorset and Hampshire have always been hot spots. There's a main reason for that, that's for deer, because these are areas that have higher numbers of deer than anywhere else. And then of course, it's the main food item for these animals. But they don't just eat deer, of course. They eat other carnivores because they're apex predators. They are actually needed in the food system. And without them, the whole pyramid of the food chain collapses. You need that top predator to control other predators. So we need the leopards, lynx and pumas to eat badgers, foxes, otters, polecats, birds of prey, herons, cormorants, what have you. They all control it. And that's why we actually need them here. And they're doing a very good job in keeping all our wildlife healthy. And without them, we would have more disease. So it's a good thing that these cats are taking the weak the old and the disease because that's what they're naturally there to do and that's what they are doing. Many people say what do these animals eat? Yes I know I just mentioned the deer and, and carnivores what they eat but it's also um, worthy noting what, what their teeth are like as well. This is a leopard 
a female leopard, um, an average size leopard. And as you can see, she has these very large canine teeth. They don't have many molars or premolars, but they have carnassials, and these are for crunching. So this is how this deer skull, this seeker stag, got to be like this, because these teeth crunch away at this bone. Now, cats eat lots of bone. They eat lots of skin. They need to for their digestive system. So a lot of animals they eat, um, there's not a lot left sometimes. A small animal, for example, a rabbit or a hare or a small fox will be totally consumed by this animal. So you might not find anything. They eat bone as well, leg bones, skull, everything. And sometimes a whole carcass can disappear apart from say bits of fur or a tail or something like that. So a lot of their kills aren't necessarily found. It's only the larger animals that are found and we find the remains of those now, leopards and pumas do eat farm stock, such as sheep, cattle, turkeys, geese, what have you, but not all the time. They actually prefer wild animals. It's because cats need fatless animals. They need strong muscle. They want venison. They don't want sheep or mutton or lamb. And they don't like, um, they, they also don't like wool, to be honest. They prefer normal hair to be eaten rather than wool. And a leopard will go out of its way not to kill sheep. It also knows that sheep are often owned by people. And once it sees that relationship between people and their animals, a leopard is intelligent enough to keep out of the way. If there are plenty of wild animals in the cat's territory, it would always eat those wild animals first before the last resort of attacking a farm animal but it does happen and it happens often even in some of my study areas there are many sheep goats calves that have been eaten by big cats but on the whole they are very few and far between i've had many farmers contact me they found sheep that have been eaten and i've looked and i said yes that's definitely a big cat that's eaten that yet the cat has not come back for another few months until it eats another one. Sometimes they only have one sheep taken out of a hundred and then never again. Other times they might have five or six sheep taken out of their flock and the animal might come back repeatedly taking animals. That could be because the animal is injured and it cannot eat um, wild animals. What often happens is people shoot these animals and when they do shoot the animals and they don't kill them, that's when they cause a big problem. Because if a leopard or a puma cannot hunt deer, rabbits and hares, it will then turn to sheep and ducks and turkeys. And that's where you have the problem. So I never recommend people shoot at these animals at all. Because in effect, they could even be causing a man, a man, a man killer to happen. Because um, cats will occasionally very rarely eat people and they only eat people if they are injured there's something wrong with them they are old their teeth are worn down they have mouth abscesses or they have broken limbs that's the only time when these cats will actually attack human beings so to prevent that from happening i suggest that people don't go out shooting these animals because they could be responsible for manslaughter we're dealing with very intelligent animals very witty animals 20 times as more intelligent than a fox and it could be dangerous for oneself to even shoot one of these animals so it's a no-go area of course, after the cats have consumed their prey, then something comes out the other end, doesn't it? These are scats. These are both leopard scats from one of my study areas. Note the size of them. They're generally about between 25 and 35 centimetres in length. Some of them are a bit smaller, but they all contain fur and bones, sometimes hooves of deer. This particular scat here contains a whole skeleton of a squirrel. That's its skull there. So that's the kind of size that these scats are. See all its little bones in there. So they're pretty big. And they will place these scats in certain areas. If the cats have a territory, which most of them have, when they reach a certain age, they scrape on the ground, they spray the trees 
they put their scats in little junctions of paths for other animals to come along and to read them. Now you can find these quite regularly in places. They don't smell like dog poo. They smell like metallic and musky. Totally different. And there's no other British mammal that can pass a scat that big generally. Now I am talking about real leopards and pumas living wild and breeding in the UK. In actual fact we have more species than the top three which are lynx, puma and leopard. We even have smaller species of cats as well. We have jungle cats, we have leopard cats, we have servals and of course we have our native the wild cat. And I have a, a specimen here of this is um, a Dorset wild cat. This is a kitten and she is only eight weeks old and she was run over um, on the borders of Dorset and Hampshire and her teeth hadn't even erupted through her gums yet she is quite large. She's almost the size of a normal tabby cat and yet she's only eight weeks old so you can imagine how large she will be. And you can imagine how large the male would have been because males are often a third to twice the size of a female. People think that wild cats are something you only find in Scotland. Well, the Scottish wild cat is a myth. There's the European wild cat. That wild cat lived all the way across England and Ireland and France and Spain. And it still does in some areas. And maybe it's been overlooked. And maybe people bred wild cats and released them. And I know a free people in the south of England that keep wild cats. I never ask them what happens to their surplus stock, but who knows? But what I do know is we certainly do have genuine wild cats living here in Dorset and Hampshire. These are some of the photographs I have, or some of my field evidence. And uh, these are feeding habits of leopard and puma. Those carnassial teeth that I showed you earlier cut through ribs like this really cleanly. They don't gnaw the ends like foxes do, but it's like a machine. It cuts through and everything is really neat and meticulously clean. Here is a roe deer that's been turned inside out and the cats have the strength to pull the skin back from the, from the ankles right up the whole leg. A human can't even do that, but only a strong animal can turn that inside out. And we have um, a leopard skull here with a dog skull. This is a collie that was found half eaten with a hole right through its cranium, which matches the canine teeth of the leopard. This one depicts the carnassial teeth of the leopard and the imprints it makes for toothpick trauma on the bones. And there is um, a university in the UK that are dealing with this kind of evidence and they've concluded that many of these bones are indeed um, being eaten by leopards and pumas in the UK. So it's also becoming academic and scientific. The more data we have, the more universities are taking on board that this is really real, are doing their data and it's proving conclusive. And that's what we want uh, to show to the sceptics that these animals are really out there. Many people ask, if there are big cats in this country, where are their bodies? Well, in actual fact, we have lots of bodies of big cats. Many of them are hidden. Many of them are buried. Some are run over on the road. In actual fact, one year we had six reports of dead cats on motorways. I myself have found three dead cats on the roads. I found a puma, I found a hybrid animal, and I found this very strange animal here, which nobody can really identify. It looks similar to a snow leopard. The animal was at least eight feet in length. It had a four foot long tail, but its tail was very thin. It had a really thick body and it had dog-like legs, but a very cat-like head with big teeth. That animal was moved within hours when I went back to collect it to get somebody because it was so heavy I couldn't move it myself. But the army had collected it. There was army vehicles there because it was actually outside um, Bovington Tank Museum in Dorset. So animals do get run over. They get hidden. Many animals, many people um, hit big cats in the road. Um, in actual fact, a lot of our sightings are from people driving in their cars. They have near misses. Many of them actually do hit the animals and they tell the police. Sometimes the animals die and they're found and recovered. They're taken away and it's all hidden. 
and people say why would people want to hide it well there's many reasons why people hide truths it's because they do not like the public reaction or the possible public reaction or the backlashes that can happen if people were to announce that big cats were for real because there has been a conspiracy to hide the truth and there has been for decades and for good reason although i personally think it's wrong i'm an honest person and i think that if there is something like this going on people should know about it for many different reasons um the fact is many people would be afraid to go in the countryside if they knew there were pumas and leopards in every woodland there'll be farmers trying to get compensation from the government for their lost stock there'll be people with children saying you can't go over there there might be a cat in the woods and so forth and so forth well the truth is there aren't many children eaten by these cats these cats have been here for generations for over a hundred years and yet we do not have many reports of people being attacked or killed by them you are more likely to be killed by a cow in a field than you are a big cat or you are more likely to be struck by lightning than you are to be harmed by a big cat so people must get it all into perspective and not panic unnecessarily now if we want even more field evidence well here we have claw markings on trees I found many of these in certain trees in certain areas vantage point trees leopards go up and down trees on a regular basis and when they do so they leave these long scratches going up and down these are caused by their claws such as these here now we have one with a T on it one with an L on it that's because one is a tiger claw and one is a leopard claw leopards being a lot smaller than tigers have very large claws relative to body size that's because they are tree climbers so the leopards have huge claws and so you can look at a scots pine tree or an oak tree and you can find those typical claw markings up and down the trees as i regularly do these claws weren't found in the uk they're actually from taxidermy rugs and i just use them as a prop to show people other kinds of field evidence that I find are scrapes. Now all the larger cat species are territorial basically and they need to tell other animals where their territories are, what status they're in, whether they're ready to mate or not and what they do is they regularly make scrapes such as these. These are territorial scrapes along certain boundaries that are consistent maybe every two or three days a female might mark her territory if it's a male it might be every week or two in the same area but basically they use their hind feet to scrape up the debris they are laying down scent they have glands in their feet and which it, it, it emits oil and basically what they're doing is rubbing their scent on the ground so that other animals of the same species or even other species can read it and say hey this is a no-go area there's somebody already living here i will not encroach on that territory or it could be a female in heat that smells a male and says i might hang around it might be a male that smells a female and says hey there's a female within this territory i will stick around and wait for her to come into season so these are call cards they're personal id cards that are left around the place for other cats to read and it looks very much like a dog when a dog scrapes its back legs on the ground after defecating but when a dog does it it usually makes a mess all over the place but cats do it usually a far more neater and more purposeful and it does it more often there could be two three or even four scrapes along say half a kilometer of trackway so these are regularly found or well, they're regularly seen but most people just take no notice of them because they haven't got a clue what they are many of the leopards we know are actually jet black in england that's because many people kept jet black animals as status symbols in the 60s and 70s all kinds of people kept the black ones they were the best but there were spotted leopards also seen what's interesting is the first reports we have of the 1700s in england were of spotted common leopard types and the odd fact is about it the common leopard the spotted type is harder to see than a jet black animal because they are so cryptic and camouflaged yet some of them do possibly get run over in actual fact i have a pelt here of one such animal that came from eastern england 
this was roadkill and I had to stitch it all up because it was badly ripped to pieces so this one came from Lincolnshire and it's Eastern England where we have more reports of spotted leopards we still have the black ones reported but lots of people have seen these spotted animals so this is a female um, an average size leopard this is the size they are so it's, it's a very big animal in actual fact I put a skull in there it basically fits spot on although this skull isn't from this individual it's from another one but it, ba it basically fits in there so this is your average size of a leopard this is a female so a male leopard will be bigger than this the long tail leopards have tails that loop up like this generally as they walk like that that's something that a domestic cat won't do this is the foot of a leopard and it doesn't look that big but when you look at it underneath and you compare it in actual fact because this is a male leopard compared with the female leopard so my male leopard is far bigger than this female but even so you can see the three up one down of the paws there the claws aren't out until the animal dies and then claws do come out so we can see them there those very sharp claws protruding so here is the evidence we have all the field evidence and plaster casts from east dorset west hampshire borders and we got the skin of an animal come from eastern england a lot of our sightings of these large cats come from country people doing country pastimes and pursuits and a large percentage of cat sightings are actually from fishermen because let's face it somebody sitting quietly on a chair among reed beds is more likely to see wildlife than somebody running around making a lot of noise and in some areas a large percentage of our sightings are from fishermen on lakes and rivers now there's a reason for this because cats need water they are always around water waterways are good hunting grounds because these cats eat um, herons and cormorants and they also eat large fish in one of the fishing ponds um, in one of my study areas a lot of the carp have been taken by a leopard so they often patrol these areas and they're often quiet areas you don't get loud people with dogs around these areas and the, and the cats feel secure around them and they often hide up in reed beds as well and we've had hundreds of reports from fishermen of big black cats seen whilst they've been fishing so it often happens but um there's nothing to be afraid of these cats are often just looking for for um, fishing birds or fish and they're highly unlikely to be interested in you another aspect of my field analysis is dna analysis which i don't do myself but what i do is i do a preliminary check on hairs that i gather from the scats or from barbed wire fences or people find hairs dotted around and I collect these hairs and I look at it under a microscope and I can tell whether or not it's a cat hair or a dog hair, a cow or a horse. And so I do that as well. So that's a very um, integral part of the analysis because then I can say, well, that hair can be passed on for DNA analysis and then we can get either a good or a bad result. Usually we get bad results, but we have had one or two interesting results, including hybrid cats, which is more than a theory than, um, than a science but in my opinion it's become science because we have now got evidence that we have hybrids out there that's perhaps domestic cats hybridized with perhaps pumas or other species of cats it's reality otherwise we wouldn't have had results from um, university labs of hybridization so it actually happens so it's a good thing to have a good microscope and to look at people's hair that they find because even looking at a scat um a, a, a presumed big scat from a big cat 
we're looking we can look at the animal hair its prey as well as possible ingested hairs because cats lick themselves all the time they keep themselves clean and doing so they take in their own hair and that comes out the other end as well so analyzing scats can bring up their prey species as well as the species themselves just by looking at the hair so i'm jonathan mcgowan a naturalist i've been working on this for 30 years and i welcome all contributions regarding sightings animal kills footprints scats anything to do with big cats i readily take in all sightings are put on a national database and if they're local then i can often do research into these matters i have a website www.thenaturalstuff.co.uk you can have a look at the data i have on there and hopefully you would have learned a lot from the evidence i've showed you as I said, I like all kinds of contributions because it only helps people know about the truth and education is best.